Good evening. I'm Jonathan Lossis, professor at Washington University and the director of the Living Earth Collaborative, which is a biodiversity partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. In conjunction with the zoo and the St. Louis Academy of Science, the Living Earth Collaborative is delighted to present tonight's lecture. And personally, I'm equally delighted to introduce my friend and colleague, Lee Dugatkin, who is a professor of biology and distinguished university scholar at the University of Louisville. Now, given the topic of tonight's talk, it may surprise you to know that Lee made his name scientifically by studying the behavior of guppies. His early work was pathbreaking in showing that these tiny fish have a much richer and more sophisticated social life than anyone would have expected. For example, in one widely reported study, Lee showed that female guppies will copy the mate choice of other females. That is, if one female watches another female guppy choose which mate to, with whom to mate, she will pick the same male. And so that and other studies showed that guppies have very complicated social behavior. Lee rapidly became a leading scholar in the field of behavior and has published more than 150 papers in leading journals in the field. More recently, he has branched out to the study of the history of science as well. Several of his nine books that he has published are in this area, including books on the scientific work of Thomas Jefferson and the Russian prince Peter Kropotkin. Finally, I should add that Lee also has, an, has been an important educator and has written leading college textbooks in both the area of animal behavior, soon to be out in its fourth edition, and evolutionary biology. Now, before getting to the topic of tonight's lecture, I should mention that Lee is someone with extraordinarily broad and eclectic interests. Hopefully, you will be able to, for hit, for, you will be able to forgive him for being a diehard New York Yankees fan. Perhaps you'll be able to do that when you learn that as well as collecting old books, Lee is surely the world's leading collector of hotel do not disturb signs. And he also writes Seinfeld scripts that to my reading are as good as the original. But to, but to tonight's topic, two years ago Lee published his ninth book, How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog. The book has rightfully been lauded by reviewers in places like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and many others. It received many awards and accolades, include, including being the winner of the Subaru Prize for Excellence in Science Books, and being selected as one of the best science books of 2017 by both Forbes Magazine and Science Magazine. It was also shortlisted for the Hughes Prize from the British Society for the History of Science. At current count, the book has been translated into 11 languages, not only the ones you would expect, like, Ger like German and Russian, but also it's been translated into Croatian, Farsi, Arabic, Romanian, and Mongolian. In addition, Lee recently published a children's book on the Siberian fox experiment by the title of Pushinka the Bark Fox. Now, in the bad news, good news category, the bad news is that we do not have copies of Pushinka the Bark Fox here tonight. So you'll have to order those on Amazon, and I highly recommend that. But the good news is that we do have a book signing after the talk. Lee will answer questions for maybe five to 10 minutes, and then he will retire outside where you can purchase his book if you don't have it already, or buy another copy, and Lee would be happy to sign it. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Lee Dugatkin. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and, and thanks for everyone who's hosting this event. I've, I've really been looking forward to this, and, and I want to start by thanking everyone here. People have busy lives, and to come out and hear science on a weekday evening, it just it, it, it warms my heart to see this many people do that, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, and I forgive you for the ballpark view I have from my hotel room. It's almost, but not quite as bad when, as when I stayed in a hotel that had uh, Fenway Park right outside the window. But that's, that's another story. Okay, so I, I'm going to start tonight with a question. Suppose that you could build the perfect 
dog. What would be the key ingredients in your recipe? So you definitely want cute. Maybe something with floppy ears and a curly tail that wags in anticipation whenever you're around. Smart and loyal would be nice. And you definitely would want unconditional love. The thing is that you do not need to build this creature. Because for the last 60 years, a dedicated team of Russian geneticists in Siberia have been building it for you. The perfect dog, except, as you might guess from the title of the talk, it's not a dog at all, it's a fox a domesticated fox. They built it in the minus 40 degree winters of Siberia, but more importantly, they built it in the blink of an eye in terms of evolutionary time. A hundredth of the time it took our ancestors to domesticate wolves into dogs. This is my friend, colleague, and co-author Ludmila Trut. On Thursday, Ludmila turns 87 years old. And every day, including today, for the last 60 years, she has led what's come to be known as the Silver Fox domestication experiment. And for the last seven or so years, I've had the honor of working with Ludmila to try and tell this story to everyone and anyone. So I am going to tell you about foxes that will melt your hearts and lick your ears, just like this guy did five seconds after they put him in my arms in Siberia. But just as important, I'm going to tell you about cutting-edge scientific research into the question of domestication. This experiment that we're going to talk about is the gold standard for understanding the process of domestication. And if you think about it, domestication is not just something that's of interest to biologists or anthropologists. When we domesticated animals and plants. Our own evolutionary trajectory took a radically different turn than it would have otherwise. So to understand this process is to understand something fundamental about our own evolutionary past. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to try to give you an overview of this 60-year experiment. We'll talk about science. We'll talk about political intrigue. And we might even toss in a love story. So the experiment begins with this fellow right here, Dmitry Belayev. In the late 1930s, Belayev was an undergraduate student at a place called the Ivanova Agricultural Academy outside of Moscow. And he studied genetics there. And because it was an agricultural academy, he had all sorts of interactions with domesticated species. When Belayev graduated from the agricultural academy in the early 1940s, like every Soviet male of that era, he went and fought in World War II. When Belayev came back, he got a job at a place called the Central Research Laboratory for Fur Breeding Animals, also in Moscow. And they worked with many, many different fur breeding species. But the two most important by far were foxes and mink. And the reason these were so important is that the Soviet Union was essentially starving to death. They were desperate 
for Western currency. And fox furs and mink furs were two of the few reliable sources of Western income. And it was while Belayev was at the Central Research Lab that he came up with the idea for the experiment that would eventually become the silver fox domestication experiment. And here's how it all started. Belayev knew from his interaction with domesticated species as an undergraduate and from his reading of Darwin's famous book on domestication, he knew that many domesticated species shared a whole suite of characteristics. So domesticated species tend to have things like floppy ears and curly tails. They tend to have juvenilized facial and body features compared to their wild ancestors. They tend to have low stress hormone levels. They also tend to have lots and lots of variation in their coat color. And domesticated species tend to have longer reproductive periods than their wild ancestors. So not every domesticated species has every one of those characteristics, but most domesticated species have most of those characteristics. So much so that we now call that whole bunch of things I just talked about the domestication syndrome. And Belayev thought about this and he thought, you know, this is really because our ancestors domesticated species for all sorts of different reasons. Horses, we domesticated primarily for transportation. Other species we domesticated as food sources. And yet others, like dogs, we domesticated for some combination of protection and companionships. Yet no matter what we domesticate them for, they tend to show Things like floppy ears and curly tails and juvenilized facial features and low stress hormone levels. Why? Belayev's idea went like this. He thought the one thing that our ancestors always needed when they began domesticating a species, regardless if they were domesticating it to ride on it, to feed on it, to have it protect them, the one thing they always needed was an animal that would not try and bite their heads off. And so he hypothesized that the early stages of all animal domestications involved our ancestors choosing the calmest, tamest, friendliest towards human animals. Then he further hypothesized that somehow or another, and he really didn't know how, but somehow or another, all of those other characteristics in the domestication syndrome were genetically connected to selecting animals based on how friendly they were to humans. And Belayev decided he would test these ideas in real time using the foxes that he now knew so well from working at the Central Research Lab. And the idea was at its core simple in Belayev's first iteration. It was that he would eventually test hundreds of foxes every year. And he would choose the ones that were friendliest towards humans and preferentially breed them to produce pups for the next generation. And then he would do that generation after generation after generation. Foxes breed once a year, so every year is a generation. Then he would see, first of all, was he, in fact, getting friendlier, tamer, more docile foxes over the years? And also, did those other characteristics in the domestication syndrome, floppy ears and curly tails and all that, did those things start to appear if all he did was select on who was friendly to humans? Now, this idea for an experiment is an experiment in evolution and genetics. This was a gigantic problem for Belayev. Because at this time, in the mid to late 1940s now, it was illegal to do modern 
genetics in the Soviet Union. And the reason that it was illegal was because of this man, Trofim Lysenko. Lysenko was a charlatan, a fraud, a pseudoscientist who had risen up not only in the scientific ranks of the Soviet Union, but the political ranks. And he did this by arguing that modern genetics was Western bourgeois science being promulgated by wreckers and saboteurs. That a long disproven idea, something called Lamarckian inheritance, Lysenko said that was correct. And not only was it correct, he argued, even though virtually everyone knew it wasn't, not only was it correct, he said it was more in line with Soviet philosophy. And so he made up data that made it appear as though he was right. And by doing this, he rose up in the scientific hierarchy, but equally, if not more important, he became Stalin's right-hand man for science. So here is Lysenko giving one of these fire-spitting speeches where he's calling Western geneticists saboteurs and spies. And when he's finished, Stalin stands up and yells out, bravo, comrade Lysenko. Because of Lysenko, thousands of Soviet geneticists lost their jobs. Hundreds were thrown into prison. And about two dozen were murdered by Lysenko's thugs, their crime being doing modern Western genetics. This is the environment in which Belayev wants to start a large-scale experiment in genetics. Everyone knew how dangerous it was. Belayev knew best of all. Because one of those two dozen or so people that had been killed by Lysenko's thugs was Belayev's older brother, who was an up-and-coming geneticist, 20 years older than Belayev. But this is a guy who not only fought in World War II, but received endless medals for bravery. And he wasn't scared. He decided the experiment was important enough that he was going to try. He would be careful because he knew that eventually he would need lots of people to help him. He starts off in 1952 by running a tiny little pilot experiment. He has this friend of his um, in Estonia who runs one of the hundreds of fox farms that are speckled across the Soviet Union. Right? There's all this money to be made in raising foxes for their furs. Belayev knows some of the people who run these places, and he talks to one of them, and he says, I want to try and run a little pilot experiment. And what I want to do is test a couple of dozen foxes every year. And I'm going to choose the ones that are friendliest to humans, breed them, and then the next year I'm going to do the same thing with their pups when they grow up. And his colleague says, that sounds like an interesting idea. They run the experiment for five or six years, very, very small sample sizes, very much a pilot experiment. And the results are promising. He's starting to see animals that are, he thinks, genetically more predisposed to be friendly towards humans, responding to what he's doing and choosing the friendliest animals. Then, Belayev gets his big break to start a full-blown version of this silver fox domestication experiment. Because in 1958, he is offered a lead position at a new institute of biology in Novosibirsk, Siberia. Basically what happened was this. The Russian government, working with scientists, built a gigantic city called Akadem Gordak, or the Academic Village. They cleared out a chunk of Siberian forest, and they built two dozen world-class science institutes. Everything from the biology institute that Belayev was now going to move to, 
to institutes in chemistry, nuclear physics, early computer science. Now, Belayev knows that because he's getting a very powerful position in this new institute, that he is going to have the power and the money to start the full-blown Silver Fox domestication experiment. But what he's not going to have is the time to be the person who leads the experiment on a day-to-day -day basis. So right before he and his family move to Novosibirsk, he goes on a hunt for a young scientist who can lead the experiment. He's still in Moscow, and so he goes to Moscow State University, talks to some of his colleagues there, tells them what he's do interested in, and he's looking for a young scientist. And he starts interviewing people. One of the people he interviews is 24-year-old Ludmila. The interview was in 58. Ludmila remembers it as if it happened yesterday. The first thing that struck her was that when she walked in, Belayev treated her immediately as an equal. Soviet science in the late 1950s was very patriarchal. Vice directors at institutes didn't talk to undergra undergraduates as if they were equals, but Belayev did. And he said to her, here's what I want to do. I'm going to test hundreds of foxes every year. I'm going to choose the friendliest one to towards humans, preferentially breed them, year after year after year, generation after generation after generation. Then we'll see, are we getting friendlier foxes, and are we starting to see those other characteristics that we see in domestication, domesticated animals, if all we ever do is choose based on their behavior? Ludmila thinks the idea is brilliant. She loves it. She wants him. But Belayev says a couple of things to her. First thing he says is, Lysenko isn't quite as powerful as he used to be, but if he wants to, he can still make an example of us and throw us in prison. And Ludmila knew this. Anybody who studied genetics knew this. But it meant a lot to her that Belayev told her to stop and think about that. The other thing he said to her was, I've done this little pilot experiment. The results are promising. But remember, this is an experiment in evolution and domestication. It could take 20 years before anything really fundamentally interesting happens. It could take 30 years. It could take your whole life. But Ludmila wanted to be part of it. Belayev liked what he saw. He offered her the position. Six months later, Ludmila, her husband, and their two-year-old daughter hop on a train from, Russia, from Moscow to Siberia, which is no easy train ride, to begin the experiment. From day one, Ludmila will tell you her motto came, comes directly from the beautiful children's story, The Little Prince, where the fox tells the little prince that you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. So Ludmila gets to Novosibirsk in Siberia and goes to Akadem Gorodok, where this institute is. Now, in 1959-1960, they were ready to start the experiment, but they did not have a giant experimental farm yet built at Akadem Gordok. Belayev was working on getting money, but they didn't have the space or the money yet. So for the first year or so, what Ludmila did was go all over the Soviet Union, sampling these fox farms where they're breeding foxes for their furs, to find a place where she can start the domestication experiment. And finally, she settles on a place called the Lesnoy Fox Farm which is about a 12-hour overnight train ride from Akadem Gordok. And Ludmila's plan is that she will go down to Lesnoy four times a year, sometimes for two or three weeks, and sometimes for two or three months, to start the full-blown experiment. So this place, Lesnoy, was gigantic. It was a cash cow for the Soviet government. At any given time, there might be 10,000 foxes at Lesnoy being bred for fancy, shiny furs to ship to the West. When Ludmila first went to the director and said, what I want to do 
is test about 500 foxes every year to see how, who's, who's the friendliest towards humans. The guy thought she was crazy. Why would you want to waste your time doing something like that? But when Ludmila said, Belayev has sent me, the director said, fine, it's not going to bother me. Go test 500 foxes. So Ludmila starts. And the routine has changed over the last 60 years. But at its heart, it's very similar to what I'm going to show you, which is the protocol from day one. So every day at 6 o'clock in the morning, Ludmila would get up. And she would go methodically from cage to cage. And on any given day, she might be able to test 50 foxes or so. And what she would do was she would score the foxes in terms of how they reacted to her first when she approached their cage, then when she stood by their closed cage door, then when she opened up the cage door, and finally when she put something, either a stick, a piece of food, her hand inside a very, very thick glove, something into the cage. And the foxes were scored on a scale of one to four, where higher numbers meant they were calmer towards Ludmila. And every one of the 500 or so foxes that she would test in a given year were tested twice. First when they were puppies, and then, or kits more technically, but puppies sound nicer, one, when they were pups, and then another time when they were adults. When she had done that, she would then choose the 10% of the males who were friendliest towards humans and the 10% of females who were friendliest towards humans and breed them. And they would produce the pups for the next generation. Those pups would be tested once when they were young, once when they were an adult, and then the next generation, she would choose the 10% of those that were the calmest and friendliest. And she would do this year after year. Now, Initially, Ludmila will tell you that these foxes were not particularly friendly. She describes them as fire-breathing dragons. Most of them were very aggressive towards her, but some were less so. So the ones that had high calmness scores very early on in the experiment, it's not as if they were friendly, they just weren't particularly nasty. Okay? But as time went on, that began to change. Even after a couple of generations, two or three generations into the experiment, there were a few, just a few foxes, like this one here, whose name Laska, which means gentle, that were calm enough that Ludmila could actually hold them in her arms. Just after two or three generations of breeding, selecting the calmest, tamest animals. So she goes year after year after year, and we've got to get through 60 years. So let's move five years into the future, five generations into the experiment. And Lamila has come up with a slightly more sophisticated scale now. What she has are what she calls class three foxes. These are foxes that run away when she approaches or they're aggressive towards her. And they never are the ones chosen to produce pups for the next generation in the experiment. Then there are class two foxes like Laska and Kisa who are calm enough that they can be handled by people but they don't show any emotional responses. And then there were a few, about 2% at this time of the foxes, they're what were the meal called class one foxes. Not only could they be held but they displayed emotional responses towards people, and at this time that meant towards Ludmilla, because she was the only person. They were friendly towards her. They wagged their tails when she approached them, and they whined and they whimpered when she left, just like your dog. At that time, they made up one or two percent of the population. Today, 60 years later, about 85 percent of them are class one. A year later, she has to expand her classification system to what she now calls a subset of the class one foxes, the class one E, or elite domesticated foxes. So here's a description of these foxes in Ludmila's own words. 
In the sixth generation, she says, there appeared pups that eagerly sought contact with humans. Not only tail wagging, but whining, whimpering, and licking our hands in a dog-like fashion. After just six years, six generations of choosing the calmest animals, they now had animals that were extraordinarily friendly. What's more, in the sixth generation, a few, just a few, of the elite foxes were not only wagging their tails when Ludmilla approached, they were wagging their curly tails. Wild foxes typically do not have curly tails. It's the first of those domestication syndrome traits to appear in the foxes, based only on whether they're friendly or not. Now they were seeing the first of these other things that we see in domesticated species. A couple of more years go by now, Lysenko is no longer a threat, and they have built an experimental farm where they can do the work right there near Akadem Gordok. This is what the farm looks like on a nice day in the Siberian winter. At any given time, there could be six, six, six seven, eight hundred foxes here. Each one of these sheds houses about 50 foxes or so. Having the experimental farm there was really important to Ludmila for a couple of reasons. First of all, it meant that rather than going down to that Lesnoy farm 12 hours away, even three or four times a year, for months sometimes. But now, every day, she work, could work on the experiment. What's more, she would have a team of people to help her. So that was really useful. The other thing that was equally important to her was that Belayev now was close by. He could really very rarely go down to Lesnoy. He was just too busy. But now, he could come visit the foxes. And just as important, if something really interesting happened, Ludmila could get Belayev there right away. And one of those really interesting things happened a couple of years later. And her name was Merta or Dream. Dream was the first of the domesticated foxes to have floppy ears. Another one of the characteristics in the domestication syndrome, always keeping in mind, that you don't, you don't get chosen to be someone to produce pups whether, based on whether you have a curly tail or floppy ears. These are things that are coming about strictly based on choosing the friendliest animals. Right? So Dream had these floppy ears. Now typically, a fox in the wild does have floppy ears till they're about six weeks old. And then their ears shoot ramrod straight the way that you imagine a fox running around in the wild. Six weeks, Dream's ears were still drooping. Two months, they were drooping. Three months, they were drooping. Four months, they were still drooping. Ludmila called Belayev out there. He looked, and he was stunned. Ludmila remembers he turned around to her, and he said, what kind of wonder is this? Now, they not only had very friendly animals, but they had some of them displaying curly tails and floppy ears. Belayev used to take a slide of dream and show it during talks that he was giving mostly in, in the Soviet Union, but now it, uh, starting to go around the world talking about this, telling people about what they were doing. And he would come back and he would tell Ludmila that some of his colleagues in the audience would literally accuse him of trying to stick up a picture of a dog puppy to convince the audience that their work was producing a domesticated fox. That's how much dream looked like a so, the experiment goes on year after year. Choose the 10% of the calmest animals, have them breed, they produce the pups for the next generation. By 1974, what they found was their domesticated foxes had stress hormone levels that were half the level of a typical wild fox. What's more, they were beginning to see all sorts of other interesting things in the domesticated foxes by this time. So we're 15 generations into the experiment. All of this is happening in the blink of an eye in terms of evolution. They found 
that the elite domesticated pups were opening up their eyes a couple of days earlier than a normal fox would, a wild fox. They responded to sounds earlier than the wild foxes. Ludmilla said while this was happening, they used to joke with one another that it was almost as if the pups couldn't wait to start interacting with people. They were beginning to see hints that female domesticated foxes had a longer reproductive period. This is another one of those things that's part of the domestication syndrome. Typically, foxes breed for like 10 days in the wild. The elite domesticated females, they bred for about 14 days. Not dramatic, but significant. Uh-oh. Okay, good. Uh, not so good, okay. Hold on. Hold on, let me see if my, if my connection is, is, is loose here, okay? By this time, they were also seeing all sorts of strange things happening to their foxes. Um, so, uh, let me see here what's going on. Uh, can we get a little AV help up here? Um, I don't quite know why it's doing that. And if, it, if we have this for too long a period, I can without the slides, although they're so pretty. Yeah, but we're back, but let's see. Let's stay on. Do you have a VGA cord? Do you have another HDMI cable? Do you have another HDMI connector? My Mac. Okay. All right, so I'll keep going as, as we get uh, the HDMI connector. So in addition to what I just told you, they were starting to see all kinds of strange color patterns. Another trait that's typical to domesticated animals. And in particular, they were seeing this really odd white star-shaped pattern that was beginning to appear on the foreheads of some of the domesticated foxes. If any of you are horse enthusiasts, you know that you sometimes see this in horses. You also see it in other domesticated species. All of these things were happening now, all based on choosing the calmest, friendliest animals. So at this point, they decide that they are going to expand the experiment. Now, in addition to selecting the top 10% of the animals that are friendliest towards humans, they are going to have another line of foxes. These foxes are going to be the 10% who are most aggressive and least friendliest towards humans. The reason they did this was not because they were interested so much in aggression, but because they thought this new aggressive line of foxes might help them understand their domesticated foxes better. All right, uh, that was an aggressive fox, so let's see if we can make him stay up here. Okay, all right. Yeah, I know. Isn't it good? Aren't you glad I got the slides back up? All right, so here's, here's why they did this, right? They, they thought that the aggressive foxes might be able to help them understand their tame foxes, and here's why. This experiment that they're doing is, is an experiment in what's called behavioral genetics. Right? All along, their assumption has been that all these changes that we've talked about are due to underlying genetic changes by choosing the calmest, friendliest ones. But any time you do an experiment in behavioral genetics, you're always worried that non-genetic factors might be influencing your results. So maybe, for example, pups learn whether to be friendly towards humans by watching their parents. That would be a non-genetic factor. 
Or maybe it depends on what kind of cocktail of hormones you're exposed to during development in your mom's uterus as to whether or not you're friendly. You're always worried these non-genetic factors are, may play a role. And the only way to know is to run an experiment. And Ludmilla decided to run that experiment. It's called a transplant experiment or a common garden experiment. The common garden here is going to be the uterus of a fox. So here's what Ludmilla did. Darn it. OK. Um, I, 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 um, uh, let, me, let me just uh, think for one second here. We don't have a VGA cable, so I really don't know what else I can do from up here. OK, so we'll just do it without the pictures, unless the AV person can do something magical to help. Um, so here's what Ludmilla had. She had pairs of foxes, and each pair was made up of two pregnant females. One was a pregnant elite domesticated fox, and one was a pregnant aggressive fox. And despite the fact that no one had ever tried anything like this with a mammal this big. Ludmilla learned the intricate surgical procedure to take six-day-old embryos out of the uterus of one female and transfer them into the uterus of the other female. And so she did this, and she swapped half of the developing embryos. So what that meant was each of the pregnant females now had a combination. She had some of her own genetic offspring, and then she had some foster offspring from the other type of the female. And the reason you do this experiment is you watch how the pups behave when they're born. And if they behave like their genetic mother, regardless of what uterus they happen to grow up in, then you can be really confident that the results you're looking at are due to genetic change. But if they behave like their foster mother, that suggests non-genetic factors. Ludmilla did this with six pairs of foxes. She swapped the embryos and waited, and waited, and waited, till the foxes gave birth. And when they gave birth, she was there as soon as the two-week-old pups were up and walking, she was there to see how they behaved. And if we had slides up here, I would show you some pictures. But let me describe to you in Ludmila's own words what she found. When she looked at the pups that an aggressive female gave birth to, some of them were her genetic offspring, and some of them were foster offspring from a tame mom. What she found was that the genetic offspring of the aggressive mother behaved exactly the way that a respectable, aggressive fox would behave. And even at two weeks old, they were growling at Ludmila or running away or acting in an aggressive manner. The foster pups, in the same clutch, immediately sauntered over and started licking Ludmila's hands. Their mom grabbed them by the neck, threw them into the corner of the cage. This is not what a respectable, young, aggressive fox is supposed to do. And what did they do but get up and walk over and start wagging their tails and licking Ludmila's hands all over. Very strong evidence that all the stuff that we've been talking about is due to underlying genetic changes. So now, at this point, Ludmila wants to push the experiment as far as it can go. And she goes to Belayev with this audacious idea. They're going to keep doing what they do. They're going to test hundreds of foxes every year and choose the 10% that are coming. But she says, in addition to that, there's this tiny little house 
on the experimental farm. And she tells Belayev, I want to move into that house with one of the elite foxes and live with them the way that we live with our dogs and the way that our ancestors lived with proto-dogs. And I want to take notes on everything that they do to see just how domesticated they've become after only 15 years. Belayev loves the idea. Ludmila has the perfect fox in mind. The fox's name is Pushinka, which means a tiny ball of fuzz. And Pushinka is the, the, the heart of the children's adaptation of, of the book. From the moment Pushinka opened her eyes, she was the friendliest of all the elite domesticated females that Ludmila had ever encountered. And she knew that Pushinka was the one to move into the house with her. But Ludmila waited till Pushinka was a year old and was pregnant. The idea was now she could move into the house with Pushinka. And not only could she take notes on what Pushinka does, but she could take notes on what the domesticated pups, who from the moment they're born, are interacting with a human, what they do. So they move in. And Pushinka and our pups have one room. Ludmila has the other room. She's living there virtually 24-7. And they live together for three months. And during those first three months, lots of people are coming to visit. It's sort of become a celebrity spot where Belayev brings every visiting scientist coming through Akadem Gordok over to what quickly became known as Pushinka's house to show them what the experiment had produced. And it wasn't just scientists. He would bring hardened generals from World War II in and they would melt when Pushinka just jumped on their laps and turned over and asked for a belly rub. For the first three months, this went on. And never once, ever, did Pushinka or any of the pups behave in an aggressive manner towards anybody. And then something happened on a July night in 1975. Ludmila, so, in, it, so I should say, in the winter it gets to be minus 50 in Siberia. In the summer, in July, you can get to be 90 degrees. So, Every night in July, Ludmila would sit on this little bench that was at the back of the house, and she would just be reading a book, relaxing. And Pushinka would be lying by her side the way that your dog might be lying by your side. And one night in July, she was doing this. And every evening around 6 or 7 p.m., there was a security guard that would go around the entire experimental farm just to make sure things were okay. And they had just hired a new security person who nobody, including Ludmila or Pushinka, knew. This person began walking towards Ludmila in what might be interpreted as a finally brisk, almost aggressive way. Ludmila looked down and she could not believe what happened. Pushinka jumped up, bolted towards the watch person, and began barking at them exactly the way that a guard dog would. The thing is, foxes do not bark. She had never heard this sound made by a fox. And her first thought was, Pushinka thinks I'm in danger and she's protecting me. But then she said, wait a minute. I'm a scientist. I should know better. It's so easy to project our emotions onto animals and think they're behaving the way we would. What's called anthropomorphism. But then, something else happened. When Ludmila walked over and began talking to the guard in a calm, friendly manner, and it was clear that she wasn't in danger, Pushinka stopped barking, slowly walked over to the bench, sat down and waited for Ludmila to come back. Is it possible that Pushinka wasn't protecting Ludmila? Of course it's possible. But from day one, Ludmila had said that what she wanted to do here was see just how far down the path of domestication the foxes had come.
And Pushinka had showed her that. Ludmila will tell you, from that night on, she knew that she could never leave the experiment. And she never has. So, I just want to take a few more minutes of your time to sort of walk you through a couple of the other things that they have found over these last 60 years or so. It's a little tougher without the slides, but um, okay. Um, so first of all, they've done all sorts of interesting molecular genetics here. And in a nutshell, what they've done is they've located where in the fox genome, where on their chromosomes, lots of the changes associated with domestication have occurred. Which is interesting in and of itself. But equally important, dog geneticists were asking the exact same question about dogs. Where on their chromosomes, in their genome in a more technical sense, are the changes linked to domestication? And lo and behold, they occur in the corresponding places in foxes and dogs. So it's, it's as if we're mimicking the process that our ancestors did, domesticating wolves into dogs, just using foxes. Now, they've done so many things besides this. But I'll end with my favorite of all the characteristics that have appeared in the domesticated foxes. Before I tell you what it is, let me tell you why it's my favorite of all the traits, all the things that the domesticated foxes have taught us. This trait, this characteristic that I'm going to show you, tell you about in a minute, not show you, tell you about, um, did not appear in the domesticated foxes until about the year 2000, about 15, 20 years ago. That means the experiment was going on more than four decades before this new thing emerged. It's the poster child for why long-term experiments are important. The other reason I love this characteristic is that it is hard to imagine anything more wonderful for a domesticated pet-like animal to have than what I'm about to tell you about. So here's the story. In around 2000, a, a, a Russian scientist at Moscow State University who studies communication and vocalization in animals approached Ludmila and said, I, I want to study the vocalizations that your foxes make. And she came to the experimental farm. Ludmila said, I would love it. Right? So one thing that everyone who works with Ludmila learns quickly is if she thinks you can help them understand their domesticated foxes, she will not only give you what you need, she will give it to you at a rate that will make your head spin. So, this woman, Svetlana Gogolova, comes year after year and she gathers 2,000 hours of the sounds made by the domesticated foxes and by other foxes that are part of the experiment, including the aggressive foxes. And it turns out that there are, made, there are about eight different sounds that foxes make if you look across the aggressive foxes and the domesticated foxes. If you just give me one second here, I am going to try, okay. Um, but there are only, there are two sounds that only the domesticated foxes make. All domesticated foxes make these, none of the fox, other foxes make it, and almost all the domesticated foxes make it from when they're very young. And I'm going to take a shot here and put my volume up as high as I possibly can and turn my computer towards you and hope that you can hear this sound. Oh, yes, good idea, I heard that, good idea. 
Can you hear that? Okay. There is no sound made by non-humans that is similar okay, to that sound, to human laughter, than that sound. And I'm not only saying that off the hip. I'm saying that if you actually put it onto a spectrogram and you look at the sound and you match it up against human laughter, there is no sound that animals make that is closer to human laughter than that. So it's almost too perfect, right? Now, you not only have a lapdog-friendly fox who is as cute as a button, but you have an animal that will laugh with you when you're laughing. It will laugh with you when you're crying. It will laugh with you when you're sleeping, because of course it's not laughing. But it's, it's incredible. It's the trait they understand least at this point, but they're working on understanding it more. If you ask Ludmilla today, 60 years into the experiment, what her hopes and dreams are for the future, she will, well, she'll give you a six hour answer that I'll give you, and I'll give you a 30 second version of it. The first thing she'll tell you is that she hopes that these animals can be registered as house pets so that they can live with people. They have plenty of these foxes that they could keep the experiment going on and on and on and still put a few hundred of them into people's houses as pets. And in fact, there are a couple of dozen of these foxes living in people's houses in the United States and Europe as pets. They're extraordinarily expensive, but all the money goes to the experiment. Um, the problem is that technically they are still considered exotics. And that means that the rules about whether you can have them not only vary from country to country and state to state, but city to city and subdivision to subdivision. Ludmila's hope is that she can go through this very long technical process to get them classified as a house pet. And then they can be anywhere. And she knows that what they've done is they've created a new kind of pet. And they want some of these to be, be in people's houses. The other thing that Ludmila will tell you is that one day, that she, one day she won't be able to do this anymore. But that she hopes that this experiment goes on and on and on. So do I. I hope you do. And I appreciate you coming out here tonight and your patience with the slides. Thank you very much. And, um, so I am happy to take questions uh, for a few minutes. And then if we want to go out and, and do any book signing, that's also fine with me. So um, yes, first question. Sure, so the question was, how inbred are, were the foxes at the beginning? Let me answer that one first. The answer is, they were fanatics to avoid inbreeding. So they had initially about 130 foxes, and then quickly a lot more than that, and they did pedigree analyses so that they made, with, with the constraint that they, that they needed to get a certain number to breed for the next generation, they minimized any inbreeding. And the other question was, did they consider an, a, a line that they were selecting for other things besides com... Right. Right. So, right, so did they ever do an experiment where instead of selecting on um, how friendly the animals were, if they selected on one of the other characteristics in domesticated animals? No, they did not. They did not. Now, there's good re... Well, so, no, they didn't. And they, I, we can talk more ab about uh, why and, 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 and that sort of thing afterwards, if you like. Yes. Yeah, please. Mm-hmm. 
Right. So, you know, it's so the question was, how long do foxes live compared to dogs, and did that change over time in the experiment? Um, you know, it's remarkable that we, we, it's not exactly clear what the average life expectancy of wild foxes are, but what we can say in, uh, with the domestic, with the, with the foxes in the experiment, you know, they live a good seven years. Okay? Now, there were no changes in their life expectancy as a result of any of the different things that they selected for. Seven years is probably way longer on than on average a wild fox lives, but then again, you know, nothing's trying to eat these foxes and diseases are minimized and they get a very high um, vitamin diet and all of that. But, 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 but how long they live was not one of the other things that changed based on choosing the calmest, friendliest animals. Um, yeah. 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 Right, so um, let, me, let me do the first question first, which was um, what other things changed? So I mentioned the floppy ears and the curly tails. I briefly mentioned that they were getting much more variation in coat color. So basically they were seeing all kinds of modeled fur patterns that's very typical to see in domesticated species and they were showing that more so than, than wild foxes. Um, I gave it one more shot to see if the slides would go on, but they won't. Um, the other thing that I had a nice picture of is that um, they began to um, develop much more dog-like faces. And what I mean is that they have shorter, rounder snouts as a result of the selection for calmness. Um, more dog-like snouts. They also have um, their... their they're sort of chunkier and lower to the ground than a, than a wild fox. So, you know, when you think of a wild fox, you think of them running around on these very gracile limbs. Domesticated foxes have some of that, but they're, but they're, but they're heavier and they don't have as, as uh, slim a limbs as, as wild foxes. Um, and so, you know, they look differently. Uh, they had much lower stress hormone levels. They also had much uh, longer reproductive times. Um, in fact, I didn't get a chance to, to show you this, but, but um, on rare occasions, a couple of years, they actually produce pups twice a year, which is absolutely unheard of in foxes, but very, very typical that in a domesticated species, for the wild ancestor to reproduce once, but for the domesticated descendant to reproduce numerous times during the year, it, it didn't happen a lot in the fox experiment, but it did happen a couple of years. Um, so those were sort of the major changes uh, in terms of the way that they looked. Oh, the smell, right, the smell. So the question was, uh, they, 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 they have very strong odors. Uh, this is a giant, this is a real problem for even the ones that are living in people's houses now. Uh, the, the two problems are they really have a very strong odor. And um, the other problem is that they are, they, they are so excited and so happy to interact with people that they're constantly peeing all over you. So, I mean, uh, yeah. So the question was, could this, could this develop into a new species? The answer is, it's possible. In principle, this could happen, right? They're fanatics now about making sure that their foxes don't interact with wild foxes because they want to avoid disease. But we know from lots of other things that they've done that if you tried to breed one of their domesticated foxes with a wild fox, it would work perfectly well. So t and, and typically we say that things are part of different species when they won't mate with each other anymore, when they won't breed. It's one, that's the typical definition of their others for what makes things in a different species. That is not the case yet with the domesticated foxes. Keep in mind, though, all the changes we've talked about have occurred in 60 years. This is, this is nothing evolutionarily. 
What would happen if the experiment went on 500 years or 1,000, you know, or, or 500 generations or 600 generations? Still a very, very small evolutionary time frame, but by then maybe the differences are big enough that they wouldn't breed with wild foxes and they would be a new species. We just don't know, but not yet. Right. Yeah, so the question is, um, can you use obedience training to, to deal with some of the issues we talked about? I don't think it helps with the problem I discussed with peeing all over you, but, but people actually, there was one student um, who did a little side project. So typically, they, they're very careful. They don't want the foxes in the experiment to learn anything, because they want to know whether or not these changes are due to genetic changes. But this student did a little side project, and she basically asked the question, can you train them? And the answer is yes, and they can be trained just as well as dogs. So I, you could probably Google up so a few of these foxes living in people's houses. They will fetch, they will sit, they will respond to their names, they'll do anything that a good, respectable dog would if you train them to do it. But the key thing is, all the things we've been talking about so far, they're not the result of training, but they can be trained. I think maybe I should take one, or, one, one more question and then uh, we can move it to the outside. Uh, sure. Yes. It's a great question. So the question is, why hasn't it happened before? Because it seemed so easy for them to do this. I, I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, at one level, we don't know the answer, and that's a great question. So the question is, why, more generally, one could ask, how come, so, how come lots and lots of other things haven't been domesticated if, in fact, it can be done like this? It's, the answer is probably very complicated, but the one thing we can say for sure is you have to realize that this was pinpoint intense selection for one thing. So typically, like when you are, like our ancestors, would have not been selecting the top 10% of the friendliest animals and controlling for every possible other thing, right? So this is really, really intense selection. Probably orders of magnitude more intense than what our ancestors did. That's probably part of the reason that we don't see a naturally domesticated, why, why our ancestors didn't naturally try to domesticate foxes. But, but, it, it, but it is a good question, uh, given that it appears as though to domesticate an animal perhaps is not quite as difficult as we thought it is. Why more things have not been domesticated over time? And, and I, don't have, I don't know why that is. But it's certainly worth thinking about. All right, thank you again, and I appreciate your patience with the slides. I'm really sorry. <laughs> So copies of how to, train, how to Tame a Fox are available for sale at the front desk, and Lee would be happy to sign those, or copies you already have. Yes, absolutely. So let me just grab this. And, uh, well, that was great, and you did. Uh